UNITV are very proud to present a special broadcast in collaboration with the Students' Union. For the first time, you will be able to submit your questions online to our candidates for full-time officers. This will be broadcast online and in the student union bars. It is very important that you as the viewer actively engage in the show tonight. You can submit your questions online by joining in the conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag SussexElections. Tonight we will be joined by candidates for Operations Officer, Communications Officer, Activities Officer, Education Officer and Welfare Officer. We will also be joined by the candidate for President. First of all, we will be joined by the candidates for Operation Officer. But before that, you will now see the Officer Intro videos. Hi, I'm Katerina. I'm running for Operations Officer. Um, my extensive experience in the Union as a student councillor and an active member of different committees and societies on campus has given me a good uh, insight onto how the Union works. I feel like some aspects of the Union can be a bit too bureaucratic and difficult to engage with, and I want to change that. I want the Union to be more democratic and engaging, and I'll do that through um, introducing things such as participatory budgeting, through which students can decide what the, stu what the Students' Union is spending their money on. Secondly, I want to increase environmental sustainability through projects like increasing bike and maintenance access and the creation of a Sussex-based free cycle website uh, to go along with the existing free shop so we can reduce our waste and become more environmentally sustainable. Thirdly, but not, not less importantly, um, I want the university's investments to be readily available for all students who care about those. Um, I want to be able to campaign to make the university disengage, disinvest and stop making business with any unethical companies or banks. So for a union that puts students before profit, vote CAT for UPS. Hi, I'm Khánh from Vietnam. I'm standing for Operation Officer. Uh, I hope that I will receive your fully support so that we will make this academic year become the year of uh, sharing and caring, sharing between students and caring student life. Please vote for me and join the action plan. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carl and I'm running for Operations Officer because I believe in a sustainable student union for everyone on and off campus. I'd like to build on the work that's been done over the past few years in creating an environmentally friendly and ethical union. That means I want to produce more bike shelters on campus in secure locations. I'd also like to ensure we've got more fair trade products in our shops and bars and lobby the university and other unions around the country to do the same. I want to make union finances more accessible, so I'll regularly publish updates on exactly how individual outlets are doing. But perhaps my main campaign point is this. I'd like to start a union venue in town, which will bring some of the values of campus to the wider community, and doing so create a greater surplus to invest in student services, as well as providing jobs to students and giving us a greatly needed income boost to this union. I believe that by having a student union venue in town, we'll be able to provide a perfect meeting place for students, as well as catering to societies, sports clubs and much, much more who want to run events in the centre of Brighton. Please tick the box for Carl Sorton Cox. The operations officer is responsible for ensuring that the union remains financially sustainable. They are also responsible for overseeing the union's commercial activities and in making sure that the union acts in an ethical and responsible manner. First of all, we will be joined by Katerina Cavalho. <coughs> so the first question of tonight, Katerina, in the union outlets, should the prices be raised or lowered, bearing in mind that the profits go to the union? Um, I think the union outlets should look into providing the best services, products at the best quality price relation. Um, I think students, as full members of the union, should have more of a say into what is sold in the shops and bars of the union, and this will make them more regular consumers of the union label, therefore increasing profit. Um, my manifesto has three specific points uh, on increasing student input in the union's finances and outlet managing. It is my belief that if we manage to make the union's finances more accessible and easily understandable to students, then we will be able to promote genuine student involvement in things like the expenditures. If elected, I want to give students regular updates uh, of where the union money is going. 
and presented in an intellig intelligible way, in kind of the Guardian style way of presenting budgets. Do you know the graphics that the, uni the, gra the Guardian uses? Um, I think this is like a really simple step into making the finances uh, easily understandable. Um, I want to make students, get students truly involved uh, in the union's budgeting, introducing participatory budgeting. I feel like the students shouldn't just be passive consumers of services, but they should be an integral constitutive part of the union. And I think promoting student involvement in the very running of the union is important to achieve that. And that would include obviously in the running of the shops and bars and what gets sold there. Okay, Katerina, now moving on to the second question. When buying products, you will usually have a choice between the cheaper option or the more expensive ethical option. Mm. Which of these two options would you choose? Well, obviously my job as operations officer would be to ensure that we're financially sustainable. So naturally, any options will have to be weighted in light of their financial sustainability. With that said, however, one of the reasons for which I'm running uh, is because I'm passionate about social justice, equality and sustainability. The Students' Union is a very well-equipped body to facilitate student-led change, be it on campus or on a wider scale. The union should represent students, defend students' interests and provide the best possible services for its members, but also not forget that it's inserted in the wider world. I wish the union to become a leading institution in student participation in social issues and to become the reflection of the principled student body that constitutes it. So I think, therefore, the union should make further efforts to minimise its environmental impact, for example, uh, to move towards greener to, to move towards the use of green energy um, and to uh, disassociate from any unethical practices, be it uh, things in the shops and bars. Um, unethical practices include things like uh, using companies or providers that are um, implicit in war crimes, in workers' rights okay, Katarina, violations. Okay, so, so out of the two options, which one would you pick? Well, I think that having all of these considerations in light, um, we need to make a very well informed choices that will reflect the student body. And I think the student body um, is one that is very principled at Sussex. So I think we should take that in consideration. So we sh I think we should try always to go for the most ethical option available, which is not to say like just simple, um, easy label um, kind of options, um, but to go into like read the details of and the implications of what we're purchasing as a union, but obviously making it in a sustainable, in a financially sustainable light as well. Okay, and finally, how will you improve <coughs> the union's commercial outlets? How will I improve the union's commercial outlets? Well, I think I've said a lot about that actually. I think, um, I think the best way to improve them would be uh, to make them feel like they're more uh, part of the union and that the, every member of the union uh, has an actual say in what goes on in the outlets, in the commercial outlets of the union. Um, I feel like, as I was saying, that we should go beyond uh, looking at students as passive consumers uh, of services and we should try to involve them in, in everything that the union decides to do, including the budget and the spending. So essentially what you're saying is that you'll make the decision more democratic and you'll put it to the students. Well, yeah, I think if we put it more to the students, then the students themselves will, will like to take the initiative and, and to, to promote the service, to promote the, the outlets of the union. But I think there are other things that the union could be exploring that, for example... OK, Katarina, sorry, I'm going to have to stop okay. you there, otherwise we won't get through the programme. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd now like to speak to Carl Salton Cox. Carl. How would you balance making profits for the union and keeping prices low for students in our outlets? Well, I, th I think it's, it's an interesting balance. It's obviously very important to a lot of students uh, at this university. But I, th I think the point here is that to some extent, we don't need to, um, to worry too much about how much we're charging with things as long as they're not excessively high. For a simple reason is at the moment, union is in £70,000 worth of deficit. That's what's budgeted for this year. And if that is the case, then it's very important that we continue to make profits in order to be able to sustain the services that we currently provide to so that sports clubs, societies, all kinds of other things as well. I would also point out that 
although a recent student survey done by the shops and bars at, at the union did say that one of the p- things that students uh, mattered to students most was the pricing, so low level pricing. So would you would you keep the prices low, or would you lower them, keep them at the same I think price? That, I think or I personally believe that they shouldn't be raised any further, but uh, and that they should st- stay similar. But as I was saying, a recent survey did show that the two top things that students cared about most at this university for our union was uh, firstly um, pricing and secondly the fact that we're a social enterprise i.e the money goes back to students okay um thank you we'll have to move on to the next question now so second of all um would you choose the more expensive ethical option or the cheaper option if you are faced with a choice between the two i would say we actually i I have to mess your question around a bit there because i don't think we have to choose between them largely the reason why our unit isn't able to stock um products, at, uh, fair trade products at a decent price is because we get all our products from the National Union of Students trading arm. They currently don't have a very pro- progressive ethical policy, which basically means we can't get the products we want to. In the bars particularly, we can't get things like fair trade rum. In the shops, there isn't an- enough stock provided at decent prices. As an operations officer, I would lobby the NUS directly to try and make them, them have a more progressive ethical policy, which basically will mean we'll be able to get the stuff cheaper. And in that way, we give students the choice. It's all about choice. I think every product we have should have a fair trade alternative, and people should have the choice to choose between them. So I really don't think that the question is a problem. If we lobby the NUS and get them to change their policy, not only us as a union, but unions around the country will be able to have cheaper fair trade products for everyone. Okay, thank you, Carl. No problem. And finally, in your manifesto, you say that you want to open a union bar in Brighton. Do you think that this is a sensible option considering the recent decline in the bar industry? For instance, Oceana are going into liquidation. Do you think the union should be focusing and investing in such a risky business? I would have to take you up on the, on the fact that you say it's risky. Um, there's been a lo- large number of res- uh, research done in Brighton area actually particularly. It's one of the few places in the UK where the trend is not actually negative in terms of bars closing down. Also, leases in Brighton and pubs are very cheap. And there is another thing as well, of course, our union has done this before. It wasn't that long ago we had a pub in town making a great turnover, which was closed down for a reason which is not entirely clear. Also, there's, a, there's another element here as well. We can either stay as we are and stagnate and continue to lose money, which means eventually we'll end up as an extra department of the university, not autonomous anymore, or we can expand. And although Oceana may be closing now, that is nothing like the kind of element we are, um, kind of thing we're looking for in a bar in town. It will be shaped by and for students from the outlet, catering for a direct market, allowing student societies to meet there as well. And having spoken to a lot of societies on campus, a lot of sports clubs, I know that people will go here and we will make a profit as well as providing a fantastic service for students. But like you said earlier, the student union are in a deficit of £77,000 this year. Correct. Considering that the union is in this financial situation, where do you think the money will come we for, have for funding this union bar? We have £300,000 reserves um, and basically the, the idea would be to use these to invest and I'm absolutely convinced the first year we'd break in even and within the second year we'd be making a handsome profit. Okay, thank you Carl, I'll have to stop you there. No problem, thank you very much. Next up, we will be joined by the candidates for communication officers, but before that you will now see the officer intro videos. Hi everyone, my name is Kieran and I want to be your communications officer. A strong and inclusive union is vital to help us protect our rights and interests and also to help us get the most out of our university experience. I think it's going to be a really tough year for the communications officer next year with low attendance in recent union meetings such as the students aside. If elected, I want to expand on my extensive union experience as budget editor-in-chief and a union representative to help support student initiatives more by investing more in student societies and by facilitating grassroots campaigning and activism. I also want to strengthen the union, the union democracy by placing you at the heart of union decision making and also by re- removing the hurdles that prevent you from getting involved and affecting union, affecting union policy. Finally, I want to promote an inclusive and accessible media with open media workshops and multilingual pieces to celebrate our diversity. I also want to ensure that student media holds, the manage, holds university management and the union to account for the de- decisions that affect the campus community, such as the closure of the recent Centre for Community Engagement. So if you like my ideas, please vote Kieran for comms. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kit, and I want to be your communications officer. I'll strengthen student media by lobbying for more money to invest in new equipment. I also don't think you should have to seek out student media, so I'll personally hand out the badger every Monday morning on campus. Get UniTV played in Falmer House reception, and get URF played in all the shops and bars. The other big issue facing the union is a lack of student engagement. At our last meeting, barely 100 students turned up. I want to transform our annual meeting into a day of action. It would be a day of protest, policy debates, talks by external speakers and performances by our societies. 
I think this new approach to student democracy will help re-engage students and unite us all around the common causes that we all care about. So for stronger media and a united Sussex, vote kit for comms. One. The communications officer is responsible for making sure that the message from the union reaches the students. They are also responsible for the overall outlook of the union. First of all, we will be joined by Kit Bradshaw. Kit, how do you think the union can more effectively communicate with the students? Well, in my first year, it was the big Stop the Cuts campaign on campus. We had hundreds of students involved in regular meetings, regular protests in Library Square. And I remember being amazed by the passion at this university. And I think we've got to try and reignite that passion and spark debate on campus. At our last um, meeting, as you may know, only 80 students turned up. Versus 800 in my first year, I think we've got to really focus to effectively communicate with the students who do want to be involved if we're united around the causes we believe in. And that's about the issues that matter to all of us. So I think we really need to unite around those causes by creating a day of action. Not a boring meeting, but a whole day where we can debate the issues, we can protest about the causes we care about, we can get talks by external speakers, and we can have performances by some of our amazing societies. Why not take our meetings outside into the courtyard at Founder House and really create an event that we can all be proud of. That's, I think, how we can communicate with the students, not by having meetings behind closed doors. I also think that communicating via paper and using leaflets is not the way forward. When all the candidates here today went to the candidates conference, we were handed with a bag full of leaflets. I just don't think that's effective in communicating to students. They get thrown away, they're often for events and then can't be used afterwards, and it's incredibly damaging for our environment and wasteful. OK, I think we get the message, Kit. Thanks, Christelle. Now, the second question. Considering that student media is funded by the union, do you think that student media should be editorially independent from the union? I think editorial independence is incredibly important. Um, those people who work in student media value that editorial independence. I've seen it work at URF in my experience at the university radio station. It's obviously working here at UniTV, doing this great event tonight. I think it can work at The Pulse, and although there's been disputes in recent years, I think it can work for the Badger as well. It does work because student media belongs to those students who volunteer their time and effort to make student media the great thing that it is here at Sussex and makes it award winning for our outlets. And I think actually it's those students who own student media, not officers in Falmer House, not unelected staff. It's the students who volunteer their hard time because they care about student media. That's who student media belongs to. Okay, I'm going to have to cut you off there. No problem. And the final question, if you think that the student media needs more funding, where do you think this is going to come from in the union's budget? Student media is incredibly complexly funded at the moment. My manifesto point is about improving student media and lobbying for more funding to be clearly allocated in the union budget. At the moment, for example, the Badger gets a block grant that only just covers its printing costs. The Pulse doesn't get any funding at all and therefore is out of print. UniTV and URF are funded as a society and have to apply for basic things like their licence to broadcast. I think that's unacceptable. I think we should clarify the funding process so all outlets can get funded equally. Okay, just equally. to stop you there, but where actually is the money coming from? It's not new money, it's reallocating the budget, it's making it clearer so each outlet is not funded separately. What I'm there to do as, as a communications officer, if I was elected, was to clearly allocate the budget. At the moment the Badger is the only outlet that gets a set budget. I think it's making it clear to all outlets how they can get funding and lobbying the university to value student media and to fund it in a clear and consistent okay, way. Okay Kit, so if you're going to reallocate the yeah. budget then what cuts are you going to make to ensure that more is spent on student media? I don't think it's about cuts. I think it's about making it clearer. At the moment, as I've explained, it's an incredibly complex system. But the money has to come from somewhere. The money is already there. It's just allocated in complex ways. At the moment, UniTV and URF have to apply for their basic running costs. That's overly complex. It's about saying that would be ring fence, just like the Badger's printing costs are ring fence. It's just about delivering that money in a different way so we don't need the extra burden on the media outlets having to apply for funding. Now, this is incredibly complex, but what I want to do is strengthen student media. That's my aim. Strengthen student media and unite Sussex around common causes. It's not These complex financial issues are for the union to deal with, and that's what I would do as comms officer. But my goal is to strengthen student media, and that's what, how I think I would do it. OK, Kit. Thank you. Thanks very much. Next up, we will be joined by Kieran Byrne.
Kieran, how do you think the union can more effectively communicate with the students at Sussex University? I think there are lots of things that um, the union can do to communicate with its members, but I actually think this question is a bit of a red herring. I don't think the issue is how we communicate with members. I think the important thing is to engage with members and to make members engage with the union as well. I think when we communicate with members, we're advertising to them, we're throwing banners at them and saying, elect you, nominate yourself for an election, and that's great, but it, there's no point having that without the engagement there. People are not going to stand for election or go to a, a, a union meeting simply because they see an advertisement. They're going to do it because they care about the union and they care about the issues that are involved. So therefore, I think that we need to put a lot more energy and effort into not just advertising for these meetings and for these elections, but into our societies and into grassroots campaigns and you know, and as Kit said in, you know, in our first year there was the, the, stop, the stop the Cuts campaign that was you know, that, that attracted 800, 900 people to a meeting not just 50 like we seen the other week that was because people cared about those issues and I think we need to make people care again and realise that the union is relevant to those struggles and to those, and to those issues so therefore I think that we need to you know, invest more in, into the societies, get more people involved at the union at every level and then people want to stand for election people want to come to meetings because people care and people realise that the union is relevant to them and people will realise therefore that a stronger union, a more inclusive union, a more democratic union is better for all of us because then it can better defend our rights and interests and make our university experience as good as it possibly can be. OK, thank you, Kieran. And the second question, should the student media which is funded by the union be editorially independent of the union? I think this is a very complex issue and as editor-in-chief of the Badger, this is a matter that I've had to deal with on an almost weekly basis over the past two years. I think that, you know, of course, Editorial independence is important when it comes to things like scrutinising the officers. I think I absolutely think that you know, the media should be completely independent from officers. They shouldn't have a say into how they are scrutinised. I think they should be held account for the manifestos, quite brutally held account for the manifestos. I hope that if I am elected, I will be brutally held account for my manifesto. I also think, though, that I don't completely agree with Kit. I think that media, I think that media belongs to the student body. I think it belongs to all of us. I, know I dedicate a lot of time to the Badger and I work very hard, but I don't think I own the Badger. I think everyone owns the Badger. Therefore, I think that, yes, although I think it should, it should have the editorial independence to scrutinise the officers and to hold the union to account, I think that it should, it also needs to respect the democratic policies of the student body for whom it exists and for whom it is there. So I think that, I think that, you know, when it comes to policies like the motion against objectification of women, I think that media ha has to abide by that and has to, you know, it can't have independence to, to do what it likes in that respect. I think it has to respect the democratic decisions of the student body and the union policy. OK, let's make sure voted. we move on with the questions. Okay. In your manifesto, you talk about publicising sports and society events. Yeah. Which publicity channels do you propose to utilise that you haven't utilised already? I think there's, there's what we have I think there's, there's, we can do lots of kind of like things on Facebook. We can use social media. We can public like, and make sure that we're actually engaging with the societies and seeing what events that they want published. I think sometimes I think it's not that no, it's not about the way of the being publicised at the minute. I think it's that you no, know, that perhaps the link isn't there strong enough between the union and the societies, and that they're not investing enough into the societies to get back out of them what 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 needs to be publicised. I think major events like sports matches and and big big fundraising. You no, know, I think there's a lot more we can do, such as you know using posters, using the badge more, using media social media, the internet, Twitter, there's lots of things we can do and I think the union uh, they just needs to throw its weight and support behind them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now we will be joined by the candidates for education officer, but before we do that, you will now see the officer intro videos. Hey, uh, I'm Maria and I'm running for education officer. Government plans to change the face of education from a public institution for all to one steered by private interests of a few. I will challenge these initiatives by campaigning against job losses and closure of courses, which decrease the quality of our education. Also, common concerns regarding assessment quality feedback and access to learning resources need to be seriously tackled. I will also aim to make the uni a more inclusive place for student parents, international students and postgraduates. Hi, I'm Rachel and I'm running for Education Officer. This next year is going to be a really important one for all universities with the fee increases and the controversial government proposals. I want to ensure that Sussex students make the most out of their academic experience despite this. I want timetable study skills lectures for all first years as well as UK study skills lectures for international students. I also feel that the new term structure is going to give rise to a lot of unforeseen problems that are going to have to be dealt with effectively and swiftly. I'll do this through direct communication with the students and feedback from the student reps to ensure that no one suffers as a, as a result of this. Vote Rachel for education. 
Hello, my name's Maggie and I'm running for Education Officer. I want students to have more contact with their tutors, such as more time with their academic advisors, and also to have better feedback on their exams and their assignments, giving them the time to discuss with their tutors their progress and any problems they may be having. And I also will stand against the negative impacts of government spending cuts and privatisation to our education, working hard to protect both the students and the lecturers. So vote for Maggie to put your education in safe hands. Thanks. The education officer is responsible for ensuring that there is advice and looking after students on academic concerns and matters. They are also responsible for overseeing the student rep scheme. We'll now be joined by Maria De Silva. Maria, what would you do to improve the library as a working environment? Um, well, basically, like our campus library, as any other public library or large library, faces issues like um, antisocial is is <laughs> antisocial issues of noise complaints and um, eating in libraries and so forth and that needs to be tackled through increasing like the vigilance that the librarians have in the library um, and making this more of an integral part of their job. M but one, I th one of the key issues that I find in the library and, and one of the key ways of making a better working space is to increase the desk, um, desk space and the computer space and in the recent remodeling of the library this was um, a great number of the desk spaces were taken away and were instead replaced by, replaced by these fancy sofas and so aesthetic um, concerns were put above student needs and um, I personally always find it very difficult to find a desk and I'll, even when I bring my own computer. Um, also issues concerning shelving and access to learning, ex um, um, learning resources are another key issue because Often students find it hard to find books and due to shelving problems and also because um, a lot of books that um, students need for one course are often um, allocated to a very small number of, peop of people because there's only a limited amount of books. So there needs to be a bit more coordination between the library and schools to ensure that there's um, enough supply for every subject. So just to recap you would call for um, more desk space and also to make sure that the connection is strong between the academic departments and yeah. the library. Okay. Also, postgraduate um, spaces need to be provided for. There's, there's been a recent improvement in the third floor of the library um, because they have very specific study commitments and they need to be given more space than, and I would definitely lobby for more library space for postgraduates as well. And moving on, is the National Student Survey important in your opinion? Um, well, it serves an important purpose in retrieving student feedback. And for example, one of the two key issues that were presented last year at Sussex were assessment feedback and access to learning resources, which is like, I've personally found one of the, like assessment feedback, one of the most important issues that, um, academic issues that we face that, it varies and there hasn't been enough um, enough um, attention given to it, basically. Um, however, the essence of the NSS derives from this increased marketization of education that has been happening in the last decades, basically. And it creates a self-perpetuating system where elite universities stay on top and those um, and the other universities struggle to compete, um, creating a two-tier two, two university system. Um, Saying that, like it is very important for, as I said, that student feedback remains one of the core um, s core structures of the university, and this could be done. Um, the university could develop its own independent um, student feedback mechanism, um, and it obviously has enough resources too. And this would be a more useful way to use university resources as opposed to like the expensive building developments that the university has invested in recently. Okay, thank you. And how would you support international students in adapting to a new working environment? Well, basically, international students um, often come to the UK not having English as their first language or having very poor 
English skills and on top of that they they're not familiar with the system and come from very varied back educational background systems and they need to um, there are existing workshops but they they they're very weak and they're not um, they're not implemented enough and they're not um, not 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 forced upon basically enough on the students because and they, and they themselves feel you know they come into a new place they don't feel like um, it, it can't be up to them to take the initiative to go find these resources these resources need to go find them and so things like um, referencing and essay skills and studying skills um, need to be um, further further developed with these students and like most of the disciplinary cases that the university that students face um, are are international students and this isn't because they um, they happen to plagiarize more it's just because they don't know how the system works and they're not familiar with the system so okay thank you yeah. next if I could call to the stand Maggie Fitzherbert Maggie, what would you do to improve the library as a working environment? Um, well, first of all, I think that we need to make sure that students know how to use the library um, and that there should be compulsory, uh, in your first year, compulsory workshops about the resources available and how to find resources. Because I know that they were on offer, but I remember as a fresher not really taking it that seriously and not realising what a big impact um, they actually had. And then it was too late and then to catch up later is quite... Sorry, it's quite a serious problem. Um, and also, when you're in the library, um, it seems to me that there's an awful lot of talking and it's quite difficult to find somewhere quiet. So I would advocate expanding the silent study areas and also setting aside some computer clusters specifically for silent study areas. Um, also, as everyone knows, the internet reliability in the library is not very good um, and that straightforwardly needs to be improved because when people are working to a deadline and they can't connect to Wi-Fi, it's, it's just a complete nightmare. And also, if you're using laptops as well, um, I think that the library should be, uh, I think it should be lending out laptop locks or at least um, offering subsidised ones for students to buy because I'm not sure about the exact statistics of how many laptops get stolen from the library but it doesn't make it a very nice working environment, constantly worrying that someone's going to come along and take it. Um, also, uh, the printing um, system in the library isn't very efficient, and I think one of the ways that this could be improved is if they made a mechanism where you could um, send uh, documents to the printer from your laptop. Um, and I say this because I remember when I was a okay, freshman... So, sorry, I'm going sorry. to have to stop you yeah, there. No, that's fine. We're almost halfway through the programme, ah, so right. we're going <laughs> to have to carry on. What is your opinion on the National Student Survey? Um, I haven't actually completely made up my mind on this one. Um, I do think it's very good to have a centralised feedback system and I think it's great that students are given the opportunity to give their feedback. Um, and also obviously it's really important for prospective students to be able to compare their various choices. But I wouldn't like to think that Sussex is putting the prospective students before the current students. Um, and I don't think it's the best way to identify certain problems, especially if they're specific problems, like if they're to do with a certain department or even certain lecturers and staff, because it'll all just get lost in the overall jumble of statistics. And Sussex is an above average university, and uh, I wouldn't like to see certain problems just going amiss because they're just lost in the, yeah, in the overall statistics. Okay, and finally, what actions would you like to see the NUS and the university taking in response to the government cuts in education? Um, well, I think they need to take a much more focal stand about this um, and prepare much more of their own analysis to present this to, to the government. I mean, the NUS as a whole does have a lot of swing, but it has been hesitant to um, be uh, strong about this. Um, and the university um, obviously is facing cuts from the government and it has to work out how to deal with those and how to uh, make sure that our academia isn't affected by that. But in the meantime, it shouldn't just go without a fight. The university needs to take a really strong point. Um, and, but they need, to, they need to know that it's important to students and that it's worth doing as well. And so I think it's important for students to really lobby the university, to ask the university to put their swing behind what decisions are made in government. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next up, we'll be joined by Rachel Gooch. What would you do to improve the working environment in the library? 
Well, as far as I'm concerned, there are three main issues affecting the library at the moment. And the first one, um, I would say, is Wi-Fi connection. Um, at the end of last year, Sussex put a lot of money into improving the Wi-Fi system on campus, and we just haven't seen that reflected in the library. I've had a lot of feedback from students saying that they can't connect or it's very temperamental when they do and um, we just it's very important that it's very frustrating for students bringing their laptops in and then finding that they can't connect to the internet they can't use online resources which can be valuable to their um, their degree yes uni tv has been experiencing those problems tonight <laughs> yeah. you had to start an hour later than re yeah. <laughs> uh, exactly so um and secondly for uh, for students bringing in laptops um a number of people have said to me that most of the plug sockets that are available in the library still aren't working despite the renovation being apparently finished and I think it's going to be re it's really important that the um, the library do something about this because again it's a very frustrating issue for students working on their laptops um, and also obviously at the moment people there's some very mixed opinions about the the noise level in the library and one of the opinions I have um, I have is that silent zones are they're sort of a backwards mentality. If you label something as a silent zone, people are then going to assume that anything outside of that zone, it's okay to just talk and be social. And I find a lot of people, when I've asked them about this, they say, yeah, that's true, you know, in there they think it's a silent zone, but, and so out here we can just chat with our friends. Um, so I'd say sort of try and implement a general silent zone rule for the entire library and then allocate group work areas. There's already the, the study um, rooms, which are really useful. Um, and then sort of encourage people to use um, other spaces that are available on campus that uh, sort of like such as Pevensey or the Geography Resource Centre or um, there's a really nice new study space in Fulton as well. Okay and is the National Student Survey important? Yes I think it is important um, in terms of general feedback so for example one of the points um, from last year was um, people weren't happy with the sort of um, with basically with the library and that was because of the renovation so obviously as a d direct reflection of what was going on in the library students weren't happy so that gave us a good general feel about what was going on in the university however um, I do feel that the National Student Survey quantifies immeasurable aspects of um, the university experience into a ranking system that isn't truly reflect, uh, reflective of the students um, so for example if 90% of the students say they're happy with course feedback um, the university is going to use that to say, okay, yeah, we look great. Um, and just prospective students say, l and, you know, this many students are happy, but there's still the 10% that aren't happy, and we can't just, they can't just be a number. These people, these are real people that are, aren't happy with their um, assessment feedback, and the university can't overlook that. So what I'd say is that um, I'd encourage people to do the survey because it does highlight general problems, but I would also um, encourage students to engage with the services that are available to them such as the student reps, um, their academic advisors, the advice and representation centre and even coming to the, the elected officers themselves. Okay Rachel and we've just had a question through from a second year life science undergraduate mm -hmm. who asks your policy on having compulsory lectures on skills and referencing are very useful ideas however would you implement the student mentors in this scheme as this would be lost work for them? Um, yeah, I think it could be it could be easily done that we could um, include the student mentors in this scheme. Sort of what I meant was um, when I said this was that for first years, I think it's it's really um, a scary whether you're coming from sort of access courses, um, A levels. It's a really scary transition into degree level, and I think we've all experienced that at some point. And it's not enough to just have sort of lectures in the first week when people aren't, are still settling in. Um, I wanted to implement a series of study skills lectures tailored to each course. Um, so, you know, for maybe it's IT skills for some of them or um, essay skills for another. Um, but this would this sort of, I think that the student mentors could carry this on because obviously um, students aren't going to get all the information they need just from those lectures and they might want refreshing. Or even um, we can maybe incorporate a way that the student mentors could run those lectures. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Thank you. If you're watching online, then you can participate in the Twitter conversation by using the hashtag Sussex Elections. Next, we will be joined by the candidates for activities officer. But before we do that, you will now see the officer intro videos. Hey everyone, my name is Richard Master, and this week I'm running for activities officer. Please go and check out my website at www.voterichard.me. 
A few of the things which I want to do in my manifesto are include postgraduate students and medical students. I want to give students the opportunity to gain coaching qualifications. And I want to make this campus the best campus by making it a bit more vibrant and a bit more exciting. I feel as though I can do that by creating a better freshers week and making that more exciting. And I feel that I can do it as well through creating intramural competitions. So why not have Northfield against East Slope or Stanmer Court against York House and make campus exciting and fun and not just the dull thing which it can be now. Hello, my name is Ryan and I'm running for Activities Officer. If I were to be elected, I would like to find support for volunteering opportunities such as Project V and also offer opportunities for sports and societies to share their skills with the local community. In addition, I would like to raise awareness of the union to the students and what it can offer for them. So, if you see me walking around campus over the next couple of days, stop me and say hello and vote Ryan. Hi, I'm Chrissy Dyson and I'm running for Activities Officer this year. The main points of my manifesto are bigger and better publicising for RAG events, discounted gym prices for students uh, already paying for sports fed memberships, uh, working closely with full-time officers um, so that po political campaigns can be more accessible to students in the student body, and expanding links with the community so sports and societies um, can form long-term relationships with churches, charities and schools in Brighton. In general, I'd like to reach out to more students, get them more involved in the union, um, because three years at university should be more than just a degree. So vote Chrissy Derson for activities. Hi, I'm Peter Overy and standing for activities. I'd really like to improve society's ability to get at the facilities that the university already has and also improve their knowledge of those facilities. I'd also like to make volunteering a lot more beneficial for both volunteer and organisation. Vote for Peter Overbury. The Activities Officer is responsible for overseeing the sports clubs, the societies and also the volunteering projects. They also oversee the large-scale events that take place throughout the Sussex calendar, including the Graduation Ball and Freshers' Week. First of all, if we could be joined by Chrissy Durston. Chrissy, with student numbers increasing in the next couple of years, how will you work to make sure that these extra students have the space and resources that they need to participate in the sport and the societies? Um, well, although student numbers are increasing, obviously um, tuition fees increasing means that we're getting triple the amount of money from first years coming to Sussex next year. Um, so I think as activities officer next year, it's really important for me to be lobbying the university um, to put a lot more money aside for sports societies and volunteering. I know that if I was a first year coming to Sussex next year, I would be expecting a lot more from the university than I might have done um, in previous years. In terms of extra space and facilities, I think it's really important for the union to have enough money um, so we can provide alternative facilities or space to train or rehearse. Um, so for instance, perhaps having enough money to use space on the Brighton campus, so match play and rehearsals up there. Um, obviously it's cheaper to use Sussex, but if we had more money we'd have the alternatives. Um, I also talk in my manifesto about um, providing more support for sports and societies to find external sponsorship. So even though that might only be a little bit of money, um, extra money coming into the sports society that year, um, it would mean that they'd have a little bit money, more money to spend on equipment or extra room or hall hire. Where are you going to get the money from? Uh, that was about external sponsorships. So that's, to oh, you mean the first part? Um, well, I think it's just um, about lobbying the university. Obviously the activities has have a lot of support with the union. Um, and. Um, facility improvement is important enough, um, so if we are taking on extra students, uh, I think it should be a big priority for the union. Okay, thank you. And the Attenborough Centre for the Creative Arts is rescheduled to open next year. How will you work with the centre staff to ensure that students actively participate in the plays and the performances at the Attenborough, Attenborough Centre for Creative Arts? Uh, well, I think initially with a new building, um, it's important to have a competent room booking service or rehearsal booking service. I know from feedback from a lot of the societies that people aren't happy with room book booking services, so they book a meeting, arrive and find out that someone else is already in that room. So I think before publicising the space in the centre, we need to be sure that the space is there for societies to use. So I think that's really important firstly. Um, I also think it's really important to have good connections with societies um, through Facebook and mailing lists so they're aware that the space is there for them to use. And um, 
another idea was that um, potentially holding the activities conference, which is normally held in September, October, um, largely in the Attenborough Centre. So even if people wouldn't normally visit that area of the university, holding an event like that where so many sports and societies people attend is going to raise awareness for um, the new building. Okay, thank you. And in your manifesto, you don't refer to many societies apart from RAG. How would you intend to support the other societies besides RAG? Um, to be honest, I think every society uh, just wants someone that is open and approachable so they can go in even if they know nothing about um, looking for a grant for something that they want to do or organising an event. They just want someone who they can walk in and say, look, I've got no idea about this. Can you sit down with me and talk to me about how easy it is to get money for it? How easy it is uh, for me to organise it? And can you help me organise it? Um, and I just hope that I'm the sort of personality that people will feel they can walk in and I can get that information from me. Okay, thank you, Chrissy. That's okay. Next up, we will be joined by Ryan Foster. Ryan, Hello. with student numbers increasing in the next couple of years, how will you ensure that the new intake of students are provided with adequate facilities and resources to participate in the societies and sports? Um, I think a big part of this question is kind of um, how that it's kind of dealt with um, from an admin side of it with the union. Um, I've had a lot of experience using the room booking systems and things along those lines and finding ways to make them more manageable and more open for people who um, may or, may, or may, may not know exactly how it works. Um, I think a big part of it is to kind of find other spaces across campus rather than um, outside of um, what, um, the union's buildings. Um, for example, um, I know that Drama Society and also the uh, Swarm Society have used um, university rooms uh, for some of their meetings and I think this is an option that should be explored to make it more clear because at the moment it's quite a confusing process. Um, it's it would be nice to find a way to make that um, easier and more accessible for the majority of societies. Okay, thank you. And the Attenborough Centre for Creative Arts is scheduled to reopen next year. What will you do to work with the staff at the centre to ensure that students are involved? Um, the Attenborough Centre is actually something that's quite close to my heart. Um, working with the Drama Society, being president of the Drama Society, the access to theatres, uh, a new theatre space, and new workshop spaces is something that I've been um, talking to and talking about people who have been involved for a while. Um, to have access to it would be very good, and um, I have at points been approached as part of the Drama Society to kind of give uh, my sort of um, opinion on how we could sort of um, play into having some access as students, as the union, um, in it. Um, and I like to think that um, it, it would it would be an accessible space, um, as well as um, clearing up more spaces within the Farmer House Union building as is. Um, so I think just kind of having a clear communication would be very helpful in that respect. Okay, and my final question is, in your manifesto, you do not mention the sports clubs. What will you do to ensure that the sports clubs remain active? Um, sports is, I'll admit, um, something that I'm slightly less um, knowledgeable about. However, I've done quite a lot of research before coming into this post, and I, I can tell, and you can see through the student media, that the sports clubs are getting... Um, they're getting... they're good teams, um, and um, it's basically a case of listening to what they want from them and kind of expanding on um, the trial sections that um, the tryout sex, um, sessions that they've been promoting recently which have been um, fantastically well received as I understand it um, and kind of making sure that, that they're, they have the option to kind of expand on their advertising and also on um, their options for kind of what they want to do with it and where they want to see the direction of their teams going. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next we will be joined by Richard Mashita. With student numbers increasing in the next couple of years, how will you work to make sure that these extra students are actively engaged in the sports and the societies? We've seen that student numbers are increasing and we've seen that through Northfield and um, those numbers are going to increase throughout the next few years. <coughs> I think it's all about giving students opportunities and this is where my intramural competitions um, comes into play where we're giving students the opportunity to participate in activities outside of clubs and societies. The university is always in need of uh, funding and as part of my manifesto as well I'm uh, looking into um, getting external funding uh, for um, societies and clubs. Um, I can do this through uh, national or um, 
local um, organizations and through funding schemes. Have you got any organizations in mind? Yes, um, through my own experience. I've been able to uh, gain um, funding from the LTA, the Lawn Tennis Association, and through that I've been able to become a qualified tennis coach. And this is one of the many um, schemes which I would like to bring into other clubs and societies. Would they not just fund the tennis clubs or would they also fund the different societies and the different volunteers? The LTA projects? would um, only be interested in tennis of course, but I've approached a number of other organisations and looking into um, other organisations, um, be it cricket, football or be it any of the uh, political societies and uh, looking um, with them to see if there are possibilities for them to, um, if not help in terms of funding, then uh, at least be able to help in terms of maybe donating equipment or their services towards the uh, clubs and societies. The Attenborough Centre for Creative Arts is scheduled to reopen next year. What will you do to ensure that the students are actively involved in the centre's running? Firstly, I think it's a great thing that the uh, centre is opening up again, and I think it's honourable that they've named it after Lord Attenborough. Um, the centre is part of the university's, um, uh, uh, sorry, in, um, it's part of the university's uh, long-term scheme of things, which is um, making the future. And as part of this scheme, um, I think what the centre is all about is it's a um, multicultural melting pot where students have the opportunity to share their ideas, beliefs and cultures um, as well as um, it gives op students the opportunity to showcase their talent and showcase the talent of Sussex but it also gives students the opportunity for them to um, see the talent that there is at, at uh, Sussex and um, be inspired about it and be able to be innovative and creative and uh, do more things. As well as that, I think that the centre would be um, a great place, once again, to showcase talent such okay. as Vimka. Okay, thank you. I'm afraid we're going to have to so move on. And my final question is, in your manifesto, you don't mention much about the volunteering projects. How would you propose to support the volunteering projects at Sussex University? Yes, the volunteering. Um, I myself has be, have been a part of volunteering. Um, through um, the qualifi uh, qualification I gained um, and becoming a tennis coach, I was then able to, with Project V, be um, a start up uh, tennis coaching in one of the local um, schools. And this is one of the thing, uh, things in my manifesto, is I want to give students the opportunity to gain qualifications and then to be able, with those qualifications, be able to go out um, and be able to communicate um, with the local community and give them the opportunity to showcase um, their new qualifications through volunteering. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we will be joined by the candidates for welfare officer. But before we are, you will now see the officer intro videos. Hi, I'm Millie and I'm running for welfare. The areas I'll be focusing on, if elected, are services, representation and well-being. I'll be increasing access to services on campus, such as counselling and sexual health. I will also be working on ways in which concerns can be addressed at their earliest stage. It is important that issues are identified before we hit rock bottom. Finally, I'll be working hard to ensure that your voices are heard, making the Student Union accessible and understandable to all. So for Hands On Help, vote for Millie. Hi, I'm Stephanie. I'm in the position of Wealth Officer of the Student Union. My campaign is based on three main points, unity, inclusion and support. I'm running because I want to support you guys on your non-academic concerns and also make sure that you're involved in decisions affecting you. For more information about my campaign, my manifesto and just find out my experience, go online. Otherwise, you see me on campus, stop me, ask me, let's talk. Thank you and don't forget to vote. Hi, my name's Indy and I'm the Students' Union Welfare Officer and I've decided to rerun in the elections because I'd really like the opportunity to build on my experience and my knowledge that I've gained and also to work on current and new projects and initiatives and ideas. Um, some of the main points I've got this year on my manifesto include student safety, um, increasing awareness and prevention strategies, uh, methods of reporting and support for students and also student health. I think there could be a, a greater union focus um, on physical and psychological health um, information and signposting for students. 
Um, I'd also like to work on um, community engagement. I've already started work with a few neighbourhood community groups and it'd be great to get more um, initiatives for students on campus and off campus and also with the prospect of, of better graduate employment um, by building up these relationships while st students are still students rather than once they've graduated and then uh, want to stay in Brighton and don't have that kind of network beforehand. Um, and I'd also like to open up the representation and engagement forum that I set up earlier this year to all students to help feed into the union and increase the representation that we have um, of all students. So if you like the sound of these ideas and others that you can check out, then please vote for Indy. Hi, I'm Nadia and I'm running for welfare. If elected, I want to improve student health, both physical and mental, and improve student housing, both on and off campus. I also want to improve representation and diversity. I've been at Sussex for four years now and I've worked in one of the campus shops and I've had an amazing time but I know this isn't the case for everyone and I want to change that. Vote Nadia for welfare. Welfare for everyone. Hi, my name's Jess Bayliss and I'm running for welfare officer. I'm just going to take you through a few of the points I'm focusing on in my manifesto. The first one is encouraging widening participation, particularly by increasing the number and uh, a variety of um, grants and bursaries available to students facing financial hardship. Second point in my manifesto is really fostering improvement of equality and diversity policy. And the third point is making welfare more accessible um, in a number of ways, but particularly by providing an out of hours welfare service, um, something like a nightline. Okay, so vote Jess for welfare, please, and I promise I'll do a good job. Bonjour, my name is Mikey, and I'm running for welfare officer. And if I was elected, there was three things that I'd like to take on. First thing, the allocation of the Access to Learning Fund, or the Hardship Fund. I'd like to try and reduce the red tape and increase the union oversight over the allocation of it, because the uni isn't doing enough to help the struggling students. Secondly, I want to battle to reopen unisex, this time using the help of volunteers. And thirdly, I'd like the union's presence to be known at the local authority meetings, whereby the residents of Brighton are trying to limit the number of student housing available. And that's pretty much it. I'll see you in Library Square. The Welfare Officer is responsible for overseeing any non-academic concerns that the students have. These include issues with campus accommodation, to paying fees or to complaints. First of all, could we be joined by Jess Bayliss? Jess, my first question to you. What are the implications of the increasing number of international students at Sussex University? Okay, uh, I think the number of international students um, increasing is, um, is challenging the union to find new ways of reacting and engaging with different groups of students. Um, it's also a great opportunity to encourage diversity at Sussex and make campus even more dynamic. Um, <clears throat> in terms of engaging with our international students, we need to ensure that they can see the union positi positively from the word go. Um, ensuring registration, fresh information, housing, banking and health advice are all accessible. That is easy to both find and use for those who may be coming to the UK for the first time. Um, we need to focus on initial, initial orientation and make sure we can assist international students and hopefully engage with them at the same time. Um, making closer ties with the international students office um, can hopefully help us do this. Um, strengthening representative structures is something I'm really, really keen to do, and you'll see in my manifesto. Um, this is likely to benefit international students and the union by allowing us, allowing us to develop better policies, celebrations, events and welfare protocol. And second of all, what do you think is the biggest issue with student housing? Um, in terms of student housing, I think there's a clear shortage um, in Brighton Centre, and this has allowed landlords to exploit students and charge extortionate prices for rent. Um, Rate Your Landlord and the new letting service um, are great ways of tackling these issues and I'm keen to encourage these. The more we can influence the ho uh, student housing market in Brighton, the better. Um, another housing problem I've picked up on is the sheer lack of disabled students' housing. We need to push the university to create more, uh, but creating new residences arbitrarily on the outskirts of campus is thoughtless and inadequate. Not all new builds are in the right place. I think we need to encourage the university to consider more residential conversions and be more considerate in general when they're allocating vulnerable students housing. Okay, and finally, how would you find funding to provide out-of-hours welfare and safety provisions? I'm hoping that 
there'll be some voluntary contribution um, on behalf of students who'd be willing to go through a training process. But if not, I'm really keen to set up links with community groups in Brighton who deal with this sort of thing already. Um, there's quite a few. Um, there's quite a few survivors. Uh, like the Survivors Network is a, a great place to start. And in your manifesto, you talk about the gum clinic drop-in sessions. Yeah. Would you propose to open a new gum clinic on Sussex campus, or are you talking about the gum clinic in Brighton? Uh, well, obviously, we used to have unisex, which was there all week, and that proved to be too expensive, and it was cut, which is a shame. Um, so obviously, the same thing again may not go down well. But I think it'd be good to have something of the sort, at least one day a week, or maybe less, but um, definitely on campus so students don't have to travel into town to you know, uh, access those services. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Next, if we could be joined by Indy Hicks. What are the implications of the increasing amount of international students at Sussex University? Okay, so um, basically I think this, this works on several levels. There's implications for the university, implications for the students' union, and implications for the students themselves. Um, I think it's really important that with the increase of international students, we increase the amount of support available to international students. And this has to include study skills. We have to reduce the number of international students being accused of plagiarism and collusion. Um, and we also have to increase the amount of safety awareness for international students. As current welfare officer, I've seen a number of international students who have suffered from racial abuse, sexual abuse, sexual violence, and they're not given any briefing um, about these issues or general safety. And I think this is really key for when we're increasing the number of international students. Um, we also need to increase the accountability of international recruitment agencies, um, especially those that uh, work on a commission basis. Um, and within the union as well, we need to increase the uh, representation of international students. They're disproportionately uh, represented. Although we've got the international student representative officer, there needs to be more networks with the um, country-specific societies, international study abroad um, office, and... Um, generally like communicate to international students that the union is for them that it's independent from the university um, and that it works for them with them because a lot of them come from countries where the idea of a union they, they just don't have any concept like that and it's really important to communicate that that to them uh, when they first arrive okay and what do you think is the biggest issue in student housing right now okay again this question um it's really hard to pinpoint because there's loads of issues going on with student housing. Um, on campus, for example, we've got to look at rent. Uh, the university are planning to redevelop the East Slope site, which is currently the university's cheapest accommodation on campus. We really need to ensure student consultation at the early stage is not just at the end, to make sure that we're getting what students need, not just what the university thinks that the students want. Um, we also need more accessible accommodation for disabled students. It's particularly important that these students have access to accommodation on campus. I'd also like to introduce a rate your landlord type survey for first years um, so we can uh, increase the uh, scrutiny for the housing office and the university because currently there's nothing as such. Um, and with, in Brighton as well, there's obviously the Rate Your Landlord Survey, which is a really crucial tool that we can use to lobby letting agencies and uh, private landlords. Um, for example, the interim report showed that students are suffering from, well, 40% of students are suffering from extensive mould in their housing. Um, often the condition of housing is something overlooked, and I think that's something we really need to press this year. Thank you, Indy. And finally, as the current welfare officer, some of your ideas are repeated from last yes. year. How will you achieve them next year if you haven't done so yet? Yes, thank you. Um, okay, so yeah, if we look at the uh, repeated ones, we've got the buddy scheme. So this is something that I started conversations with at the beginning of my term this year, bearing in mind I've only been here five months. And one of the main issues uh, getting in the way of this is financial support. We basically decided that we really need um, a staff lead on this so that they can oversee and provide continuity to the scheme. And we currently don't have the finances to support that. So I want to look into making it a more volunteer-led scheme. Um, we just haven't had the resources to put that in place yet, but it's something I, I just think is so important to pro provide that peer-led support to new students. Um, what was the other thing? Yeah, the gender neutral toilets. So we currently have two gender neutral toilets put in place in Farmer House in the Union, but I want to widen this campaign to an accessible toilets campaign. I think we need to really increase the provision and visibility of safe um, facilities for students of all needs, gender neutral, baby changing facilities, disabled toilets. Toilets is something that uh, is quite a taboo subject, we all take for granted, but actually it, it can cause quite an issue to a large number of students and it's something that we need to be focusing on within the Union and the University. Um, I think that was the only two that I drew attention to. 
Okay, thank you. <laughs> no worries. Next up, we will be joined by Nadia Jamar. Nadia Nadia, what are the implications for the increasing amount of international students at Sussex University? Um, well, one of the things I love about Sussex is how diverse it is, and I think it's something that should really be celebrated. But um, if we are going to increase our numbers of international students, we really need to make sure that um, adequate support is in place. Um, I think it's really, really critical that if we're going to increase the numbers, that the support is in place for them and the representation as well. Um, and I think that we need to make sure there are networks available for, um, for these international students. But at the same time, I really want to promote integ um, integration with um, British students as well. Because something I've noticed is a lot of international students will say, um, oh, the only students I talk to are other international students. And that's obviously quite sad. It's not very nice. So that's something that I'd really like to do. So how will you do that? Um, I think, especially in Freshers' Week, it's a really, really critical week. I'd, I'd try and get... Um, involved with the activities officer to, um, to um, create events to bring everyone together and like really, like really, really get people to integrate with each other. Okay, thank you. And what do you think is the biggest issue in student housing? Again, I think like a lot of other candidates have said, student housing is a really, really massive issue. It's in fact one of the main points on my manifesto. Um, I think at the moment, especially with the increase of fees and how hard it is to find part-time jobs, I think that the biggest issue is fair pricing. Um, on campus, even though the Vice-Chancellor a few years ago um, said he would um, make sure that campus pricing was reasonable, reasonably priced, um, they've just expanded, they're going to expand Northfield, which is the most expensive accommodation on campus, so that doesn't seem really like it's very fair. Um, and I think as well that with um, students in living off campus, um, we've got the Rate Your Landlord survey, which is brilliant, but I'd also like to expand the results of that to um, scrutinise individual landlords, because I think we've all found that time when we move into a house and we think it's going to be brilliant. Yes, and then you, you talk about that in your manifesto, yeah. the Rate Your Landlord yeah. survey, and you talk about expanding the results. What actually do you mean by expanding the results of the Rate Your Landlord survey? Well, I'd really, because I mean, it provides results on individual lettings agencies, but I'd really like to scrutinise individual landlords, because we've all had that time when we viewed a house, we thought it's really nice, the landlord's really decent, and then when we've moved in, there's been problems, there's been issues, and it's really hard to convey that in the, in the, um, the Rate Your Landlord survey. Um, I've looked online and there's already like a website that does that, so I'd like to kind of integrate it with the Rate Your Landlord survey, perhaps. Okay, I think it'd be quite that, useful. <laughs> that was my final question. Okay. Um, if we could now be joined by Maki Matinia. Uh, all right. Um, Maki Matinia, by the way. Hello. Hello. <laughs> my first question for this evening. What are the implications of the increasing numbers of international students at Sussex? Well, I'd say there was well, quite a few massive implications, actually. Firstly, uh, I've actually just come back from doing a term abroad myself in another country, and, well, I know how much of a nightmare it can be firsthand. Now, <coughs> that was literally just going to Holland. I can imagine someone coming over from, say, China, the other side of the world, completely different culture, and they come to... Sussex, they get put in halls, a lot of people come for summer courses first to kind of get to grips with the local landscape and get to grips with the language. And uh, afterwards, generally, they're not reshuffled into other housing, they're kept in these blocks. And I think that doesn't really kind of, it's not exactly conductive to integration with the rest of the students. I think a lot of people come to another country to immerse themselves in the culture of that country. And I think the segregation that does take place, and not necessarily segregation, but it doesn't allow for all the links to be formed. Uh, secondly, so how would you try to form those links between the international students and the, the home students? <laughs> well, I think it's actually relatively quite simple. Two things. I think building on the buddy scheme that w Indy spoke about would be something well worth looking into. Secondly, I don't think it would take too much effort to work closely with the housing office as a way of, once the summer schemes are over, to implement a system where you can reshuffle, you can shuffle the international students around into new flats, into new places. And, uh, and also, I'd like to kind of expand upon the awareness of like free SIM cards at the international office. I think it's really important that as welfare officer, you work really closely with the international office because I know how daunting it can be from going to a different country and yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. And the second question, what do you think is the biggest, biggest issue in student housing right now? <sighs> oh God, that's a, that's a definite tough one. What I would say is off campus, I don't know if a lot of people are aware of this, there are things called LATs, Local Action Team Meetings. And what this is essentially is um, local neighbourhood bodies coming together and complaining about their, well, their residential areas becoming studified. 
or stud studentified, I think is the words. And so what's happening is that you're having these local authorities being lobbied by locals, and what you're actually now starting to see in certain areas is a reduction in the number of um, family flats being converted into student housing. They're trying to limit the number of people converting. I mean, housing is short enough as it is. It's a pain in the arse trying to find a house these days in Brighton, absolutely. But I think that kind of pales in insignificance to a certain extent due to the fact that in first year is one of the hardest times in your life. You're leaving your family and your friends and you're coming to a strange new place and a lot of the time I would say conflicts and, and sort of real stress is caused in between housemates and between flats by noise levels and the fact that people have, they come to uni for different things. Some people want peace and quiet and to get on, other people want to live the, the party lifestyle. So what you need to do is implement a simple system, or simple, but I think it could be worked upon if you work closely with the housing office during the application periods, if you just let me finish, um, whereby people who could opt for quieter flats and quieter areas, at the moment on East Slope, one of the noisiest flats on East Slope is situated right next to a family flat. And that is something that just really should not be happening. It's not in Eva's interest. It creates okay. so much stress in a time when you really don't need it. Okay, I think we get the drift of the argument. Thank yeah. you, Mikey. And finally, in your manifesto, you say that you want to reopen unisex. Mm -hmm. Now, unisex was previously shut due to financial considerations. Where would you expect to find the funding now to fund this new unisex project? Well, that's a good point. Um, I know that, obviously, is a... It's going to be a hard one, but what I would do is try and make use of volunteers this time. There is ample number of people from grassroots communities, community-run projects that could come in and take over the role. At the moment, you have one part-time officer, okay, who is, provides more of a signposting service to people like local clinics in Brighton. Now, I don't know about the rest of other people, but in my first year, campus is a bubble. You rarely leave it. I mean, if you do have a drug or alcohol related problem or a sexual related problem, a lot of the time it's hard enough just going to your local doctor's surgery, let alone taking the conscious step to go in. Now there are plenty of people who, in order to identify with people, you need people who have, um, who have suffered from these things themselves and who actually be happy to volunteer to actually come and help these people on a, like, a part-time or a full-time service. I actually think you could get something like unisex running with volunteers. There are people there ready to do it. So They're just waiting for something to be put in place. Where exactly will you find these volunteers? Uh, there's a number of networks. I've got a few friends that know people who know people. There's people who work in the sexual education industry. Are and, there any uh, organisations that you can point to specifically? Well, I mean, when I obviously, if I got elected welfare officer, that's something I had a, a lot of time to research into. There were, is, is Brighton. Brighton is one of the most sexually liberal places and it's the supposed drugs capital of England. If there's a lot of people that have suffered this sort of thing. There's a lot of people that want to help other people. And there's a lot of people that wouldn't mind helping other people without being paid. And it's something that I really think you could build upon. It's just someone needs to take the first step to put something into place. Okay, thank you, Mikey. If we can now be joined by Stephanie Nadekwi. Stephanie, what are the implications of the rising amount of international students at Sussex University? I think one of the most obvious problems is the obvious culture clash. Um, from my time working as a volunteer on the advice and representation desk, I've spoken to a lot of international students who have found it so difficult to actually integrate themselves with the Brighton and the British culture. So if I was elected, I would work strongly with the International Study Abroad Office and make sure that we're providing informative introductory sessions for these students um, and get them adjusted to Brighton and Brightonian life and British life. We need more events for these students, point blank. I think one of the best things about Brighton and best things about Sussex is that you can integrate without assimilating. And one of the best events I went to actually since my uni life was actually a Diwali celebration in Mandela Hall that was put on in conjunction with the union and the international office and it was just a beautiful blend of multiculturalism in terms of food, music and culture and I think we need more events like that that actually mix it in students with home students so they don't feel so isolated from everyone else. So what events are you talking about in particular? Which nationalities would you like to see hold events here at Sussex University? I think every nationality can hold an event. Um, there's a range of diverse societies that are more than willing and ready to actually put on big events. Um, one site I was involved with, the African Caribbean Asian Society, they hold an annual culture fest every year, which is phenomenal. I'd love to see the union work more closely with them as well to put on that event. I'd like to see them work more closely with the Hong Kong Society as well. There's just so much things going on, a lot of things to get involved with, a lot of events to throw, I think. Okay, thank you. And what do you think is the biggest issue in student housing right now? 
Um, one of the issues I highlighted in my highlighted in my campaign and my manifesto was the issue of improving the quality of standard for students living on campus. I've been an RA for going on two years. I've lived in around four accommodations, East Slope, Park Houses, Bright Helm, I'm now in Lewis Court, and I've never actually been content with the rent on campus. I think this is an issue that we actually have to deal with before the university starts bringing about new accommodation. As it stands, they've introduced Northfield with 800 new students, and they're thinking about introducing three other new phases of Northfield. I don't think it's fair that we're being charged £9,000 a year and yet people can hardly afford to live on campus. If I was elected, I would plan on challenging the university to bring in more affordable accommodation because I don't think we can expect students to live on campus and pay £9,000 rent if, and pay rent so high. If that's so easy, why do you think it hasn't been done already? I don't think it's easy, not at all. I don't think it's an easy job. I think it's going to be a struggle, but it's a struggle that I'm willing to actually engage in and begin. Okay, and finally, Stephanie, how would you engage a diverse range of students in university life here at Sussex? That's a good question. <laughs> I would begin by communication. Um, I keep talking to people and asking them, what is the union doing for you? What do you want from the union? And one thing that I'm getting back is I just want to be involved. And I think if you don't have your own initiatives to actually get involved in the union, you'll never know what it has to offer you. There's so much things you can do from working to volunteering to you know getting advice from the advice center even you know in terms of joining a society or a club i'd engage the students by communicating with them what we have on offer the different aspects of the union as a whole and seeing what piques their interest okay thank you stephanie You're welcome that ends our questions for welfare officers next we will be joined by the candidates for president but before we do that you will now see the officer intro video for presidents Hi, my name is Kelly McBride and I'm running to be president of our Students' Union. I'm running for a union that continually lobbies for high quality education, services and facilities and one which always holds management to account for their commitments, including those for widening access to education. I'm also running for a Students' Union that doesn't just rely on you coming to Farmer House or seeing posters to get involved. I want union officers that get out there and talk to you informally and face to face to really get to the heart of the issues that are affecting you. I will support creative and constructive campaigning and I also aim to facilitate sustainability by developing and supporting community engagement um, and also supporting student-led initiatives. Since my first year at Sussex I've been actively working um, for improvements. I've done this through talking to union and university staff um, about issues involving services, representation and engagement and I've done this most recently in my role as a quality and diversity part-time officer. I've also been working nationally with students and staff at colleges and universities um, through my role as an elected National Union Students Representative. You can find out more about what I'm standing for by seeing my manifesto on sussexstudent.com or you can check out my Facebook group, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Kelly for President. Vote Kelly for an active, equal and representative students' union. Hello, my name's Alon. I'm a third year international relations student and an elected student trustee. The union and its student membership are largely disconnected. It can become a central feature in our everyday lives, a community base and provider which democratically engages with students, effectively addressing your everyday issues. I will fight against the reforms to higher education. I'll promote students establishing a student-authored journal and hosting public events to present your work. I'll increase the union's visibility, opening weekly drop-in stores on campus for students to talk to their elected representatives. I'll fight unpaid internships, working nationally and locally to make sure that our graduates are actively supported. I'll promote staff and student unity, hosting open forums for us to jointly discuss our university's functioning. I'll support international students, organising campus events to bring together disconnected communities. From the cost of printing to the quality of your housing, the union can affect real change. For us, by us. Vote alone for president. The president is responsible for representing the union and the students at university committee meetings. They are also the university's spokesman and they represent the union at a national level and also at a local level. First of all, we will be joined by Alon Avarem. Alon, my first question to you is, do you get the best results for students by working with or against the university? Well, I think there has been a real issue over the past few years 
that the university has been implementing policies which have been severely detrimental to the quality and accessibility of our education and to the conditions of employment of our staff. It was management which, made, which forced course closures, it was management which endorsed £9,000 tuition fees and it is management which will be installing them, implementing them this September and it was management that closed the unisex services. But I don't think it's as simple as taking a side. I think it's about working with them when you can and against them or without them when you have to. We have to be tactful and operate on a case-by-case -case basis to assess our strategy as a union and understand that we are limited due to the block grant that we receive from them in the actions that we decide to implement. But referring back to the question, do you get the best for students by working with or against the university, I think we have to really assess how we establish what the best for students is. And that is really decided by engaging with students on a regular basis, by establishing drop-in stalls for students to be able to approach their elected representatives, by hosting open forums for staff and students to decide how their university functions. And by doing so, the union can really respond to the sentiment on campus and affect it and implement the policies which determine our relationship with the university. And we have a commitment as, as a union to ensure that our members' interests are defended and that they, their livelihoods on campus are, are increased. Okay, thank you, Alon. And if the union was in a precarious situation next year, we're already in a deficit of £77,000 this year, what would you do to ensure that the union was still able to deliver its core services? Well, as you noted, the union has been experiencing financial difficulties recently and um, this has predominantly been as a result of the university's cut off the block grant and of the closure of union outlets which, have been, which were essential to, to the union's uh, budget. Uh, hopefully the union will be financially stable by the time the next academic year arrives, but it is a serious risk that still faces the union and one which we have to seriously address and strategize in order to ensure the best quality services. And we have to have a range of options on the table, but I don't think job cuts, reductions to the quality of services should be one of them, and it won't be if I get in. We have to, um, we, have to we, can, we can increase the independence and financial stability of our union by generating revenue through, through multiple avenues. Mandela Hall, for instance, is, is a huge space on campus with a capacity of 600 people. If we had monthly gigs over there, we charging three pounds on the door, that's 1,800 pounds already generated in turnover and that can be pumped back into the union and provide better quality services for our students. In regard to the National Student Survey, though I'm opposed to it fundamentally, it is a system, it is a, it is a survey which is, which is designed to, to marketise our education, to place universities against each other, and a boycott is favourable if we can nationally coordinate one. I do think that we can manipulate it to our advantage to affect um, favourable union policies by making it very clear to management that if they do not uh, increase our union budget, that we will make sure by campaigning alongside students that they, 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 um, that they have negative feedback in the National Student Survey, which is the Achilles heel, if you like, of the university. And, um, and we have to also make sure that staff and student unity on campus, through open forums, through open discussions and general communication, uh, will, will make it clear to the university that Collective industrial action is also a possibility in order to secure great uh, quality services for our university. Okay, and finally, my last question is, in your manifesto, you say that you will fight the scandal on unpaid internships. How do you propose to fight this scandal? Do you propose to contact the companies and businesses individually? Mm. Yeah, well, as, as we've seen uh, nationally at the moment in the recession, there's been a growing market of unpaid internships, which is a real scandal and many students are increasingly finding themselves in a situation where they're working for free for an employer and, and obviously you have to ask the question, which, who are the students who can afford to put themselves in an unpaid internship? And they are, they are the wealthier students and it makes it, uh, employment for, uh, and accessibility for poorer students um, a, real, uh, a real issue. So I think on a local basis, we, we can strategize our policies on a local and a national level. 
in regards to a national level, we can coordinate with the NUS, the TUC, and other networks to, to, to organize other forms of protest action. But on a local level, more importantly, we can provide, I w if, I got in, if I got in, I would provide every single student member a pamphlet stating their labor rights, stating their right, labor rights regarding unpaid internships so that they know how to confront their employers if they're faced in a situation where they're not being paid. And also, I think the union should be providing the adequate services for students to pursue uh, taking uh, employees to tribunal. And I also think that we can uh, start up a, a blacklist, if you were, which uh, shows, which points out to students, prospective interns, that uh, which, which companies have been mistreating interns so that they have better awareness of which companies they should avoid in the future. Okay, thank you. And that wraps up the questions for Alan. And now ask Kelly McBride to join us. Kelly, do you get the best for students by working with or against the university? Okay, um, firstly I think there's a bit of a flaw in the question. I don't think that you can work with or against the university um, because I think that completely undermines what the purpose of a union is meant to be. If you're working with the union, uh, with the university, sorry, um, then you're you're kind of comp giving in to what they want you um, and you kind of haven't got any room to negotiate there um, and that means that you're not really representing the students that you're, you're supposed to be representing. If you're working against the union you're putting in jeopardy the fact that 80% of the union's funding is coming from the university and that's in the form of the block grant and obviously that would put the union at a massive disadvantage. Um, this doesn't mean, however, that there isn't a middle ground. Um, of course, it is mostly all about negotiations. I've heard um, the relationship between the university and the union referred to before as kind of a critical friend. Um, and I think that's really important. I think that middle ground is important. Um, on the one hand, um, you're negotiating in the university on issues which are important, um, but you're also not making the concessions, which means that students will be putting at a disadvantage just so we can be securing our funding. Um, yeah, and I've, I've been in meetings personally with staff in the past and I've found that going in with an attitude kind of going in all guns blazing against um, everything that they're proposing just isn't the way forward and they will, they will slam you down and everything you want to achieve will be blocked. So I, as I said, yeah, that middle ground is very important. Yeah. So just to recap, you would advocate that you would be the critical friend of the university? Yes, I would advocate being a critical friend. Um, but obviously it's always, always important to listen to what the students want and engage with students and go in there with a range of opinions and not just one set um, by union officers because I don't believe that's Okay, thank you, Kelly. And moving you. on to the next question. If the union found itself in a precarious financial situation next year, what would you do to ensure that the union was able to provide its call services to the students? Okay, uh, well obviously the union is aware when it's going to be facing a financial deficit because the planning is done over six months ahead. Um, I believe the financial year is in September and we already know that next financial year we're facing around a £77,000 deficit. Um, so I believe that the union right now should actually be making steps um, to ensure that that deficit is, is kind of um, caught up with. And there are ways to do this. Um, we could lobby the university for more money, that is an option, but that also may possibly undermine the independence of um, the students' union and will also maybe have to make concessions to them to be able to achieve that. Um, there is ways perhaps that we can, we can work on that and that could be through some points that I've made in my manifesto such as strengthening commu community engagement and also engagement with the student body because I know the university are, are very eager to see that increased. Um, the university also, we must remember, kind of see the students' union as a marketing opportunity uh, for them and they want us to have a strong union so they're not going to want to see us um, kind of go under so it's always important to bear that in mind with our negotiations with them. Um, I would say it's very important to stress that I would never advocate the cutting of any um, activities funding or sports funding. I think we should be finding alternative ways because we do know that this deficit is coming to um, to reduce the risk of ever, ever, ever even having to consider to make any cuts in those areas. Okay, um, thank you, Kelly. And our final question for the night comes from a second year life science undergraduate okay. who asks, Kelly, what would make students want to read your simpler guide to union democracy when students are uninterested to begin with anyway? Yeah, um, I think uh, another point I made in my manifesto was that face-to-face -face interaction with students is so important. I think a lot of people kind of see the union, or, and it's been told to me in this way, as an ivory tower. Um, and union officers aren't out there actually talking to students and finding out what they're wanting. The people that are coming to them are the people that already know what, kind of know what the union is and know that they have an issue um, that they want to come to them with. And I think that there hasn't 
been enough face-to-face -face interaction with students, officers actually going out there talking to them, not in constructed settings, not in set-up meetings, but in informal situations. For example, um, going just to sit in areas of the university such as BSMS in the foyer there and talking to students and they haven't got the time to come over to Farmer House and to talk to the officers uh, all the time because their, their courses are so content heavy. Um, and this guide that um, I, I believe should be produced, I think it's something that should be done face to face, sitting down with them, telling them, because everything a union does is important to every, every student pretty much, but some people don't care because they don't think it's relevant to them. And it's having that kind of conversation and explaining to them why it is relevant to them that's, that's really necessary. And then following on from that would be a guide, but there are steps that have to be taken before that can even be considered. Um, as something because otherwise it'll just be a, a waste of paper really. Do you I mean, think as president you'll have enough time to go out and interact with the students on a day-to-day -day basis? I do, I strongly believe that. I know um, officers and other unions manage that perfectly perfectly fine and it's definitely something I'll be able to do and I believe if you're being elected into a union position you should be working as hard as you possibly can and not just nine to five outside those hours to ensure that you're engaging your student body and I'm very very willing to put in that time and effort. Okay, thank you Kelly. Okay. That concludes tonight's questions. We hope that we have helped you to make an informed decision on who you want to vote for in the forthcoming elections. Voting begins on the 6th of February and you can vote online at www.sussexstudent.com. Before we end tonight's broadcast, I'd like to take the time to thank the people who have made this possible tonight. I would like to thank Chris Efner, who is our support technician, Hassan Youssef, who is the Student Union IT Manager, the Students' Union, Alex Ampilagov, who is the head of UniTV, and finally, the candidates who have taken the time to appear here tonight. If you have enjoyed tonight's broadcast, you can watch more UniTV videos online at our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel is UniTV Live. And in addition to that, tonight's, bro tonight's broadcast will also be published online. Once again, our YouTube channel is UniTV Live. I'm Crystal McCracken, reporting for UniTV. Until next time, good night. <laughs>